Happy Memorial Day weekend, everyone. Wherever you are today, we are glad that you are worshiping with us. My name is Reverend Terry Swan, and I'm the lead pastor for Salem and The Connection. Welcome. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, wherever we are today, bring us together as one. Help us to be met by you. Touch our hearts with your word. And may the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight. My blessed rock and redeemer, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The clip you just watched came from the very end of the movie, Hacksaw Ridge, as Corporal Desmond Doss shared a memory from the day in which he helped 75 wounded men to safety with no gun and no other soldiers at his side. Now I have to say, when I saw him share this memory for the first time, I wondered, out of all the men who cried out for mercy, for his help that day on May 5th, 1945, why did this man stand out in his memory? We may never know the answer to that question, but what we do know is that Corporal Desmond Doss modeled his life after the example of Christ, even in the most horrific of battles this nation has ever experienced. His prayer with each step was, Please, God, just help me get one more. God's story was now embedded in his own story, and the only defense he carried into battle was the hope of God's word. The Gospels tell us stories that give us glimpses of who Jesus is and the extravagant love that he demonstrates. The story of blind Bartimaeus is no exception. The Gospel of Mark sketches this story in just seven verses, and yet we see the full portrait of Christian love. This story is captured in each of the Gospels, and only Mark gives the blind beggar a name. Bartimaeus, Timaeus' son, is sitting by the roadside. I've asked Major U.S. Army Reserve retired Jeff Osborne, or Ozzy, as we know him here at Salem, to read for us the story from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. Blind Bartimaeus receives his sight. Mark chapter 10, verses 46, 52. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man. Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Lord, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I first began ministry many years ago, I came into each day of work, like most of us do, I think, with a set of things I wanted or needed to accomplish for the day. It wasn't long before I realized that my to-do list would never get done. It was inevitable that I was always getting interrupted in finishing my tasks. I can remember lamenting this to one of my mentors, Kathy McLean Davis, and she said so beautifully, well, Jesus' ministry was a life of interruptions. In other words, it isn't about you or your to-do list, Terry. That is a mentor's responsibility, to speak the truth in love, painfully sometimes but with love. That phrase, Jesus' ministry was a life of interruptions, became very important to me and shaped my ministry in many ways. I wrote it down on a strip of paper and taped it to the top of the big monitor of my computer, back when those took up most of your desk. Jesus was sent to all people, not a set of things to do or accomplish, while he was here on earth, and like me, the disciples had a hard time understanding that at first. 
placement is key when studying scripture, and it is called literary context. The story of blind Bartimaeus comes immediately right after Jesus settles an argument between Zebedee's sons, James and John, as they walk along the road. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, and by now there is a crowd that has begun to follow him. Some are following out of curiosity. Some are following along on their way to Jerusalem for the Passover and have decided to join the group for safety. Some are true disciples of Jesus, and some are following for the wrong reasons. Many thought Jesus was going to begin a revolution against Rome, and so they are seeking power. I think James and John, Zebedee's sons, nicknamed Sons of Thunder, could have been in that last category at, at this point in their journey. They make their way to the front where Jesus is walking and say, Jesus, we want you to do something for us. As you read the story, you can almost visualize Jesus look over his shoulder with a look on his face like, this should be good. They said, allow one of us to sit at your right and the other on your left when you enter in your glory. Again, I can visualize Jesus' face as he responds, you do not know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or receive the baptism I receive? And they respond, we can. Every time I read this section of the scripture, Jack Nicholson's face always goes through my mind screaming from a few good men, you can't handle the truth. Jesus knew who would be at his right and his left when he came into glory. It would be two thieves hanging on a cross. But he takes the opportunity to teach the disciples the true meaning of what this life and being great is all about. We find that in verse 44. Whoever wants to be first among you will be the slave of all. For the human one didn't come to be served, but rather to serve and to give his life to liberate many people. I'm sure the disciples were discussing and further discussing this statement as they were leaving Jericho that day. And once again, Jesus stops along the roadside at the sound of a cry for mercy. And the journey to Jerusalem is interrupted once again as it has been many, many times. Bartimaeus could not see Jesus coming, so he must have depended upon the murmurs of the crowd to know when Jesus would have been passing by. We don't know if this was his usual spot to sit and ask for support, as those with any kind of disability in this time were dependent upon others to survive. We don't know if he'd heard that Jesus would be coming through Jericho and somehow with the help of others found a spot by the side of the road. All we know is that Bartimaeus was not going to let Jesus just pass him by. Bartimaeus had hope, maybe for the first time in his life. And so he shouts out for Jesus. Jesus, son of David, show me mercy. Those around him tell him, quiet down. But holding on to hope he has, he shouts all the louder, Son of David, show me mercy. Jesus hears his plea and stops and then calls him over to him. The crowd then shifts from telling him to hush to saying, Hey, get up, have hope, come over, he's calling you. The question that Jesus asked Bartimaeus does not escape us if we remember the question James and John asked Jesus. And I secretly hope that the sons of thunder were standing right beside Jesus when he asked Bartimaeus the question. He said, what do you want me to do for you? Bartimaeus gave the answer he had dreamed of giving. With all of his vulnerability and his need on display, he said, Teacher, I want to see. 
no money. Remember, he's a beggar. He asks for money all the time. He asks for no money, no power, no prestige, no being seated at Jesus' left or right. And Jesus says, your faith has healed you. You can only imagine what Bartimaeus' face looked like when his eyes were opened and he could see. But really, he could always see. A blind man who had never been around Jesus before could clearly see who Jesus really was. And two of his disciples who followed him daily were blind. James and John were more focused on the goal of Jerusalem and glory, and, and Jesus was more focused on getting one more in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus' life and ministry was full of interruptions, and that is the good news today, because Jesus can be found most fully in those interruptions. Has your life been interrupted lately? Maybe. This crazy season of quarantine and pandemic has interrupted one of the busiest times in the lives of families. Weddings, graduations, ordinations, family spring celebrations, fundraisers, and so much more. Things had to come to a screeching halt so that the spread of the virus could be stopped. At first, like many, I lamented at what we were missing. I seemed to be more focused on the goals of, and the to-dos of ministry. I can almost hear my mentor, Kathy, saying now, Carrie, don't you remember what we talked about? And now my soul seems to be shifting to the opportunities God is offering. Jesus never had to be reminded of his purpose. He did not come for power or prestige. He did not come to rule as a political king. He came to serve, not to be served. He came to offer love and life, abundant life for all people. Offering this life one moment, one interruption at a time. Interruptions will not overwhelm us if we remember our purpose. In his book, Reaching Out, Henry Nowen asks, don't we often look at the many events of our lives as big or small interruptions, interrupting many of our plans, projects, and life schemes? Don't we feel an inner protest when a student interrupts our reading, bad weather, our summer, illness, our well-scheduled plans, the death of a dear friend, our peaceful state of mind, a cruel war, our ideas about the goodness of man, and the harsh realities of life, our good dreams about us. Nowen asks us to consider the possibility that our interruptions may well be our opportunities. Jesus did more with his interruptions than most of us do with our whole lives. Maybe this season is teaching us something. Maybe we are being given an opportunity to offer hope, to offer love, to offer God's story as it is embedded in our story in a new way. Shouldn't our prayer be, Dear God, help me share your love with just one more each and every day. Just one more. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.